apologies there. Uh, for our fall programming here at the Imperial Valley Desert Museum, we have tonight's Evening Moon Expert with Richard Carrico. Upcoming on November 14th, we have our next Evening Moon Expert featuring Carrie Malloy speaking on reflections of the past and the present, landscape, people, and narrative. Uh, Carrie is a professor at Humboldt University in California, and his focus and specialty is on indigenous genocide. And then in December, we have uh, our fall concert series titled Songs of the Desert, featuring violinist and composer Beth Chavey Hun, who is actually in attendance with, here, with us here tonight. Uh, that is going to be on December 5th, and all these events take place on Saturdays from 6 to 7.30 p.m., and they will be hosted live on Zoom. The links for both Carrie and uh, Beth's events, the Evening with an Expert, and the fall uh, season, I'm posting the links to you right now in the chat section. These are the Facebook links, and I will also provide the Zoom links later this evening once we get underway. Oh, I do apologize. That was the long link. We'll give you the shorter one. So this is the link right here that just got posted to Carrie Malloy. Will you be sending an email also or, or is Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, we will be sending uh, email alerts and reminders for you, but in case you'd like to be able to access these early, now you can get it out there and uh, put it in your calendars. Uh, the two links are available there for you. Tonight, uh, in celebration of our evening with an expert, traditionally these, uh, these events take place in the Imperial Valley Desert Museum and involve a three-course meal. Unfortunately, we cannot accomplish that tonight because of COVID-19, but we are providing a cook with us option. So if you received our email notifying you about this event, tonight's menu, which you've been invited to participate with, includes a fall salad with pears and pecans, pork chops in a single pan with apples and onions. And then Richard has been uh, so kind as to provide us with his grandmother's peach cobbler recipe. And all this, as Richard is also a sommelier, has been decided to be paired with a Martinelli Jackass Hill Vineyard mascot. Now, we encourage all of you to participate and join us in this cooking option. And if you are, then I encourage you throughout the night to share photos through your stream here of your cooking progress. If you make a very successful dish, brag and show it off to us. If you set your kitchen on fire, of course call 911, but then send us some photos of that as well. Uh, in support of this, if you do enjoy this program, we are offering it free to anyone and everyone to participate so that they may better celebrate and enjoy our desert and its history. However, the museum is requesting that you consider please making a donation to us to help us to support continuing programs like this and all the new materials and new options that we're developing while we're closed. If you are interested in doing this, you can make a donation through PayPal at the link I'm providing in the chat box. And to let everyone know, any donation of $10 will automatically enter you into a raffle with one raffle ticket for our fall fundraiser. Uh, this fall fundraiser features a raffle featuring Gold Star Wines, Off-Road Adventure, and an HDTV, all of which can be won with just the donation of a $10 ticket. This raffle is uh, gonna be ongoing across the uh, fall season, and the drawing will be during our fall concert on December 5th. In addition, we are also running an offering, oh, pardon me, we have two more guests, in addition, we are also going to be offering a silent auction. One of the board members of Imperial Valley Desert Museum, Martin Fitzerka, has actually uh, generously donated a four-night weekend getaway to Monterey on his beach house. And this is a three-bedroom, two-bath beach house right on the shore. And uh, to enter and participate in this, all you need to do is submit your bid through our Facebook, uh, uh, Facebook silent auction page. If you do not have a Facebook, you're only welcome to call in your bid or post it right here in the chat room tonight. The starting bid is $600 and minimum bid increments are $5 each. If anybody would like to make any donations outside of the PayPal, we can of course also process that over the phone here for you tonight. And the link for the silent auction
is also in the chat box for you all. And as the MC guest and uh, host of this evening, if anybody has any questions across the evening, please feel free to reach out and I'm happy to answer that while Richard is speaking. I'd like to make a comment. The yes, Marty, uh, please. screen saver is from the front porch of the place. So if everybody's seeing Martin Fitzcarra there, uh, his screensaver is a shot from the front porch of the Monterey house right there. <laughs> now, before I turn over the mic to our speaker of the night, Richard Kirko, just a few orientation and rules for tonight. We would ask once we get underway for everyone to please mute their mics and I'll be doing the same so that we can leave Richard undisturbed in his presentation. However, we do encourage everyone and anyone to ask questions across the night. Uh, for that, you can please do so in the chat, and if it's one that needs to come up during the talk, we will, I will uh, make a motion to Richard and ask the question on your behalf. We will also have an open question and answer period at the end of his talk tonight. Now, with no further ado, and all that much preamble, I'm happy to turn our uh, evening over to our speaker, Richard Carrico. Richard Carrico, his talk tonight will be on Native American trade, travel, and relations in the Anza Borrego region. He is the, a published author of the book Strangers in a Stolen Land, which is available in the Imperial Valley Desert Museum's gift shop. He is also a historian and professor at San Diego State University, where he teaches on the matters of history and archaeology. He is also, in his own words, an ethnographer and recovering archaeologist. And though I'm sure he would be too humble to admit it, Richard is also the newest member of the Imperial Valley Board Direct Imperial Valley Desert Museum's Board of Directors, and we're very fortunate to have him in that role. Ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, I'd like to turn the evening over to our host and speaker of the night, Richard Carrico. Thank you, David. So, if you would have suggested to me and probably a lot of you out there back in January and February that we would be talking through computers rather than in person, and that I'd be teaching my classes at San Diego State completely online, um, you would have sounded crazy. But here we are, here we are. So over the summer, I had to take classes to learn how to teach classes online, having taught for about 25 years. And I've actually at some level come to enjoy it. You know, I think there's always, um, do I need to push the record button? Me? Yes, Mine sorry about that. When I made you the host, it changed over. Okay, mine says it is recording, so somewhere it's recording. Yeah, it says, okay. So it's recording now, correct? Okay. Um, one thing I'd like to stress about tonight's uh, presentation is some of you have heard me talk about history or about archaeology. And so we're going to combine those two tonight and talk also about ethnography. And so David reminded me there's a big part of the world out there that ethnography is a, is a term that's not common, I suppose. So when I say that I'm a recovering archaeologist, what I mean by that is that largely I'm trying to study Native people through documentation, through oral interviews, through anthropological studies that were done back in the 1880s, 1900s, rather than just material culture. So archeology span focuses on the things that the museum does extremely well, for instance, artifacts, objects made by humans, pottery, arrow points, things of that type. And then history, of course, is looking at written histories about people and interpreting their culture and the times from a written document. So what ethnography does is it tries to combine all those, but it takes what we say is an ick view. We try to look at things from the inside out a little bit. So tonight's presentation is gonna be a combination of archeological data and anthropological information, which is ethnographic, <laughs> as well as historical. So I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint here. Richard, can I also ask you to please hit the unspotlight option on me there? I uh, Now that I'm no longer the host, I cannot do that. I don't know what, where the spotlight is. Uh, if you see my icon, the three dots in the top right corner, there'll be a button to unclick the spotlight. Uh, uh, where my images were, where my video. 
You mean your little box? Uh, my video box here. And then in the top right corner, there should be three dots. Just for a second. Um, I'm not seeing that. Right. Uh, if you'd like to sorry. just make me co I make me host again there, I do apologize. Okay. There we go. Okay. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So about halfway through the slide lecture, we're actually going to talk a little bit about where this set of sand dunes are located, is located. And it's not the Algodones. There in Imperial County. This is actually a place called El Golfo de Santa Clara, and it's on the mainland side of the Sea of Cortez. Between this particular beach is between El Golfo, the town, and Punta Panasco. Or if you're from Arizona, it's Rocky Point, right? The Punta Panasco. Um, and this is part of the end of a trail. So there are people who come from the Gila Indian Reservation over in Arizona. That uh, to Ono and Oodam, go on a salt pilgrimage, and they cross the desert, the Pinacates, and they end up just about right here. Um, and they're going down to collect salt, and there's a whole series of songs that go with it. So part of what we're going to be talking about tonight um, are trails. The trails on the ground and trails in the mind, that is through songs and dreamings, and then so songs in the sky. So we're not going to stay on earth. We're going to we're going to move around a fair amount tonight. So I'll throw some vocabulary out because I know I'm going to be giving some um, tribal names here. And if you're not familiar, you might not realize that they're spelled this way. So the Kumiai, which can be broken down into Epai, Tipai, if you wish, uh, are the people who occupied from roughly the coast of uh, San Diego, the Pacific coast, south down to Santo Tomas in Baja California, and north uh, to Agua Erionda. So if you know Spanish, that's stinking water uh, near Carlsbad, uh, California. And then out east, at least to the Algodones Dunes. And then from there on, they probably shared the territory with some of their cousins, uh, the Quitsan. The other people are the Cahuilla, which are primarily in Riverside County and the northern part of the Salton Basin. The Cupeño, so I'm up here in Warner's Ranch, Warner Springs Ranch, uh, right up the road from Ramona. And the hot springs there, Cupa, were occupied by the Cupeño, who were moved out in 1903. We have a very sad lecture. I'll be glad to give you that lecture. The Luceno are the people along the San Luis Rey River um, and up to Camp Pendleton, the Mojave, out in the Mojave Desert, along the Colorado River, Quitsan, near Yuma, used to be called the Yuman or Yuma Indians. And, and why Shumash? Well, because part of the trade we're going to be talking about tonight was with the Shumash and the Channel Island people. So these are the tribal names. Part of what I want to stress is that people throughout history and around the world have done ideational exchange. That is not just a pot or an arrow point or how to, you know, something physical, but rather concept got changed. Concept got moved about around about religion. Songs were transferred from, let's say, the Mojave to the Kumiai. Um, something about how to use a plant. You don't need to see the plant. Maybe you've already got it in your culture, but you don't use it the way somebody else did. They come and ideationally transfer this knowledge to you. I think this gets overlooked a lot, especially by, by archaeologists, because they're looking at physicality. They're looking at things you can touch, and, and sometimes that's not enough. And the last one is, if you've been in scholarship or reading magazines or kind of following the world the last 20, 25 years, globalization became the big word, the big word. Everything was about globalization and you can be against it or for it and all that. And it's, it's like it got discovered. People didn't know about globalization before that and people didn't do it, you know, until NAFTA or until we opened up the market to Taiwan or something like that. So. Being the curmudgeon that I am, I want to suggest to you that globalization has been going on for thousands of years. Marco Polo was doing globalization 
the Manila galleons that sailed from Spain around South America and over to the Philippines and then to San Diego and Santa Barbara. That's pretty global. So goods have been changing hands back and forth for thousands of years. And tonight we're going to talk about it with the native people. So I always like to throw this slide in because it's pretty educational to a lot of people. California has every language but one, the Zuni. They have every language spoken somewhere else in America, in the United States of America. So in theory, in a traditional setting, when all the languages still existed, and there were 86 of them, someone from California could go somewhere, anywhere in America, and be able to understand someone. Or if I reverse it, it makes more sense. Someone who's Iroquois, someone who speaks Cherokee, someone who is from the Great Lakes area, could come out here in theory, at least until some of the tribes were decimated, and find someone to talk to. It might not have been one-to-one -one words. It would have been more like Italian to Spanish, something like that. But they, they could understand each other. Why? Because of the diversity of this state. With the deserts, the Sierra Nevadas, the coastline, the giant lakes up in Northern California. So environmental determinalism kind of established what people speak, number one, what kind of language, and the language you speak, if you believe in the wharf safer um, culture is language view, and I do. Um, but also simply because so many people moved down the coast as they came into the new world. And now we know, based on work that some of my colleagues have done, like John Rowlandson, that people didn't just take that inland trail like we've always talked about, you know, and came down through the ice free corridors. Some people got in canoes and came down the coast. What's called the Kelp Highway. So what's a bigger trade and a bigger travel than a Kelp Highway where you're moving down the coast all the way to South America probably ultimately. So this is California. These are our family groups. These are not necessarily tribes, they're family groups. Let me give you the lay of the land here for what we're gonna be talking about tonight, which is primarily this general area here. And it should be no surprise where the trails tended to be. At some point, if you're gonna to go to the coast, you do have to come up through the mountains, this being San Diego, right? This being the Imperial Valley Museum sitting right out here by the Lazy Lizard Bar there in Ocotillo. And of course, the uh, Colorado River over here. But most trails are going to try to follow the flattest contour that they can to reduce the amount of energy that you get somewhere. There's certainly some exceptions, but in, in general. So now we're going to we start at you know, what they say in the business world, 30,000 feet. Now we're going to get down to far, far lower and look at something much closer. So looking at San Diego and Imperial County, uh, these are the cultural divisions. So for tonight's lecture, I have broken down the Kumeyaay into Ipai Tipai, Northern people, Southern people, kind of more like Western people versus Eastern people. So Ipai Tipai, Kumeyaay people, speak the same language, but they have a dialectical difference, dialectical difference. And by that, I don't mean like in a Marxian sense of the dialect. I mean, like in Boston, they say, let's go get some beer and go down the harbor and have a party. That's English, sort of, but it's a dialectical version. Or in Texas, they say, y'all. Somewhere else where I was born, back in Indiana, um, my family, if you pull a piece of string really tight, they said it was taunt. They put an N in a word that doesn't have an N in it, so they pull it taunt. That's a dialectical difference. That's what's going on with Ipai Tipai. Some archaeological differences too, but generally, essentially the same people, many levels. Kuwia, up here by the northern part of Salton Sea, going way up into Riverside County. Quitsan, focused on the Colorado River, Yuma, this area. Kukupa, who used to be up in the United States, but once the boundary came through in 1850, uh, the Kukupa ended up entirely down in Mexico, virtually entirely. Pai Pai, down here, and Luis Daniel, up along the San Luis Rey River, Mission San Luis Rey, Mission Side, by the way. So all of these people traded with each other. 
and they shared some words, they shared some songs, they shared uh, relationships. There was a great deal of intermarriage between these people. So this is one of the things that's not talked about sometimes. It's like we lock, psychologists, we lock these people in these little zones and we kind of want them to stay there because it's frankly easier for us. And we can do maps like this and put dots on the map. If you know European history, I want you to think about that like the boundary between France and Germany, Alsace Lorraine, that area. 10 years it's German, 20 years it's French, 15 years it's a mix. It goes back and forth because of warfare. In this case, it's because of their marriage. So where I am up here, it's Mesa Grande. So where I am up here at, at Fort of Hot Springs, the Cupeno, the leader of the village down here, out here called Matamo, which is where the Single Hills Golf Course is in Saquon, the leader of this village in 1700 was from up here. He was Cupeno, completely different tribe. Why did they do that? to form alliances, form alliances so that they can reduce conflict and war. And then we could get even closer. So the museum is sitting out here in, in uh, Osue clanship, which became Osuna, but these are the different clans. So you had tribes, you had villages, you had clans, what are called sibs, basically, and this was their territory. So some of you might know of or have worked with Carmen Lucas uh, from uh, Mount Laguna area. This was her clan, the Quayamai. This is her, her father's clan. And then you, you see Piper. Some of you might know Piper from some of the reservations. If you know Mike Conley and uh, Frank Salazar, uh, they're Misquis. This was their clan. So you've got clans within tribes within huge areas. And you have a lot of interaction between these people moving on. All right. These are some of the major trails. I, I apologize this did not come out as clearly as I wanted. But I think you get the idea. And some of these trails go to the islands. So sites down at La Jolla, the spindrift of site that's down there on La Jolla shores, some of the burials that were found there, their DNA was from the Channel Islands. It was from the Channel Islands. Uh, San Nicolas, the DNA was from there, these burials here in San Diego County. <clears throat> Up on Camp Pendleton at Las Flores, uh, some work that was done there back in the 70s. Uh, they, they also had DNA from the Channel Islands. And so a lot of mixture going on, a lot of mixture going on. David, do you have to admit Daniel or do I have to do that? I'm sorry, what was that, Richard? I, Daniel wanted to be admitted, and I wasn't sure if I was still hosting or you, but I clicked the button, so I assume Daniel's with us now. Excellent, and I think you can actually okay. make me a co-host again here as well. I apologize for that. I just got the setting corrected, so if you would like to, you should be able okay. to readmit me as a co-host, and I can manage it for you. Okay. Let me work my way through this first here. Absolutely. And so here's some of the trails. We did yeah. have one final question for you as well here, actually. I do apologize. Uh, this sure. was back when you were discussing sure. yeah. languages. It was regarding, uh, as a question of, since you are speaking about verbal language on a pan-continental level, is there anything you can speak to regarding uh, pan-continental sign language among indigenous groups? So non-verbal Well, language. not much. But, yeah, except to say that apparently, based on Spanish documents, and if you look at French documents, up in the Great Lakes area, and really British and, and Spanish in Florida, not just out here, they did practice what we might call a universal sign language, and it's not the same as American sign language, but, you know, some reasonably obvious things about touching the mouth for food and, you know, uh, pushing forward for danger or for spears. So I think it was reasonably universal, but not on the scale of sign language languages we have today, where sign language actually represents words and sentences put together. It's more about objects and about action. It's more verb versus noun. Okay. All right. So this is a study that a company called ASM out of Carlsbad did for the Bureau of Land Management. And it shows some of the major trails. Um, many of you within the museum world might remember J. Van Werloff. So these, these trails that are of that particular color down here, those are trails that Van Werloff reported over the years with his desert work. 
others are trails recorded um, by speaking to Native American elders. Some are from now with drone flights flying over the desert. So there's two patterns here that should be reasonably obvious. One is you've got a whole series of north-south trails, and these are linking uh, the Luisano and the Korea with the people south of the border, if you will, with stops along the way. And then you have major east-west trails, many of which ultimately become Highway 8 and Highway 94. The other thing that I'd like you to note about these trails is these are, these are corridors because these are wide swaths of land. So on that corridor, there could be three or four trails splitting off and going different places. So we call this the Yuha Hakumba uh, corridor area because it's, it's this specific area I want to kind of focus on here. And those trails link these people together. So up here in Santa Barbara, you have the Shumash, and then the Gabrileño, Luceño, and then down to Arcumiai. And then out here to Arizona, the group that was called Pohokam back when they uh, were there before the 1200 ADs, 1300s. Now it's the uh, Taono, Pohokam. Used to be called the Pima Maricopa. So these are the major trading partners. It's a big, it's a big area. And we're going to talk about what they were trading here in a second. These cultures shared landmarks and landscapes. So there again, because we have tended to put boundaries and say this is Mursenio, this is Cunyai, this is somebody else, we have tended to um, to silo these people, put them in silos. This is Granite Mountain, which you might know, out in the Anza Brego Desert. And Anza, uh, excuse me, Granite Mountain shows up in Mojave, Busan, Korea, Luiseño, Gabrileño, Cunyai, Haipai, and Kukupa. It's in their stories and their myths because it was such a prominent landmark. So it's not a matter of individual patrimony that someone owned this. Yes, it was in Kunyai territory, but it was shared. It was shared in their stories and their dreams and as a landmark. And I just completed a map for the Kunyai that's um, showing a lot of this. And we came up with something like 60 major landmarks between the coast and the Colorado River. I mean, like seriously major ones. The obvious ones, Tecate, Table Mountain, Boundary Mountain, Granite Mountain, uh, Coles Mountain. So these are on the land, and they obviously preceded the people, but they're, they're how you know where you're going from one place to another, and they're in the songs. And you sing the songs as you get near these places. So if I could have done this and had the time and thought about it, I would have a little bird song or a travel song kind of interjected into this, this presentation, but that was technologically one step uh, beyond me. So this is right down the street. So when I woke up this morning, it was about 48 degrees, and I could look out my window here that I'm looking at right now, and steam was coming off of this uh, hot springs. So uh, the water, this water right down here, and see how it's kind of undulated? It's coming out of a, a spring, it's 142 degrees. That's what the water comes out at. So the Kumyai call it Akupin. Akupin, meaning boiling water. Boiling water or hot water. So this is the Warner Springs Ranch Resort. It's closed now, went into bankruptcy some years ago. The whole story associated with that. But Akupin appears in all those languages too. Because if you came up out of the desert through Los Coyotes Canyon, up that way, you would stop here because there's fresh water ponds here as well. You could soothe yourself in the water. Not this water at 140, but uh, the Native Americans had channeled it into another pool and brought cool water into it. We got it down to about 102, 101. It's pretty much what you had in the jacuzzi at, probably. So Hakobin is known by all these different names. Every tribe basically had a name for it. Just one of the many spots. Trails across the land. Uh, this is from uh, Mark Becker, a study that he did. And uh, it's interesting how you get intersections here. So if you're ever out on a hike in our desert, maybe David or one of his cohorts takes you out on a hike once we can do that again. And you come across some of these trails, one thing you might notice is occasionally there'll be a line of rocks across them, a line of rocks across them. And those are basically spirit lines. And, and you need to step over them very carefully what they're there to do is break up 
spirits that might be following you. It was believed that by changing the trail, by having a small line of rocks, spirits that you might have brought with you, not evil necessarily, but um, foreign spirits, spirits that weren't quite happy to be where they really were, you want to leave them behind. And so you find these lines of rocks occasionally across these, um, and they're not spaced in any interval. And different people built them over different times. Some people think they go back at least two to three thousand years, and, and based on the varnish and the patina on the rocks themselves. Sometimes you'll come across cairns, which we call ducks, because sometimes they're shaped like ducks, like the bill of a duck. Um, so let me do, do a momentary soapbox thing here. If you're out in the desert or you're hiking anywhere, unless you're gonna build one of these and put a note in it that you're lost and you're now heading up the hill and you hope to God somebody finds you, don't build these things. Number one, you're confusing the archeological record. When you build an errand like this and you do you know, little things like this, someone's gonna come along in the future who might not know their geology very well, some archeologists, and recorded as an archaeological site. In theory, it is. Humans built it. Um, and the second thing is, you're kind of just messing up the landscape. So what are these used for? They are trail markers, in some cases, with native people built. In other cases, you'll see around them um, maybe hundreds of little pebbles or potsherds, broken potsherds. That's essentially, I'll use the word offering, but it's, it's a token that you have left a token in honor of the trail and the people who've gone there before and, and maybe the trials and travails they had on that trail. So we call them Karens or sometimes they're called ducks. Uh, leave them alone. And there's a tendency for some people certainly to want to pick up a shirt and take it with them. You know, don't do that. Because if 300 people do that, there's no shirts left. And, and don't do the reverse of that. You don't need to leave a dime or a nickel or a quarter on these carrots. I've seen that happen. It's like a wishing well. People throw coins into a fountain and make a wish. Don't throw coins at the carrot and make a wish. It's, it's just not, not good behavior. So, emu is what we call Orion. And I'll show you a slide of that if you're not you know, astronomically plugged in. So Orion is one of the most, in our culture, one of the most predominant or dominant uh, constellations in the skies, right? And we see a belt and a sword and sort of a body of Orion the hunter moving across the sky. For the Mojave, you see down here the word Mojave, this was a sketch made in the 1850s or 60s, and this army officer was interviewing um, Mojaves and then drew what he heard. So this is a big horn sheep, which in Mojave, this is your can be tested on this later. I hope David told you that. It can be tested, so pay attention. The Mojave call the constellation that we call Orion, they call it Amu, Amu, which means big horn sheep. The Kumiai call it Emu, Emu, the big horn sheep. And these three stars here, with what we see is Orion's belt. They see it as part of Emu, the sheep, moving across the sky. It's a whole story that goes with this, depending on the culture. But generally, he's chasing six or seven incredibly beautiful girls across the sky, from what we know as the Pleiades. And he's, he's basically moving across the sky. And on either side of him are hunters trying to kill him. And so he has a grandfather with him, and he has a friend with him moving across the sky to keep the hunters from killing, from killing Emu, if you will. This is part of the trail system. It's a trail system in the sky. And again, most human-speaking people, the Kwitsan, the Mojave, um, have this in their, in their uh, cosmos. Well, speaking of Mojaves, one of the ways we know what we know is because when Spaniards came through, they wrote accounts. And yes, they're jaded, you know, because they were Catholics trying to convert these people, or trying to conquer them in some cases, uh, doing all kinds of things to some of the local natives. But if you tease out certain things in Spanish um, entradas or their documents, their informes, you can get a lot of information. You can get a lot of information. And then you have artists who came through and sketched. These are pretty accurate, meaning the body paint is probably a white or gray clay 
It's natural in the area. The bows and the arrows are actually the right size. They're chipped in this case, right? No big headdresses, because the Mohammeds didn't wear big headdresses. A beautiful basket here. We have tattooing. Uh, she has her, uh, it's probably a combination actually of rabbit skin uh, or oak bark uh, skirt on. No sandals on, on these two uh, individuals. And it's a pretty good depiction. So those trails that I've been showing you and, and these other elements we're going to go through, I want you to imagine these people on those trails moving across them. In some cases, carrying a net behind them for a headband, if you will, uh, and a net, woven net made out of uh, fiber from agave, carrying 40, 30, 35 pounds, 35, 40 pounds. So I don't know about you, but when I was in the military, the 45 pound pack was considered a fair amount to lug it around. It may have gone up, but it used to be that was about what you had on a 15, 20 mile march. So these people were, were bringing, for instance, the Kumeyaay acorns from the Quebaca Mountains down to the desert and trading it for things in the desert. Certain boards that grew down here, salt uh, from the place where the Algodones dunes. And they were bringing 45 packs of acorns down, trading that for 30 or 45 pounds of salt and taking that back up to the mountains. It's a very elaborate trade network. They're going to Obsidian Butte, where the Salton Sea is today, and mining obsidian, the black volcanic rock, taking that back up into San Diego County, and it all over the county. So I want you to have a human image here of people on these trails. It's a little closer view, a little less busy than the other one. So you know, the museum is sitting out here. This is approximately the county line running up to Riverside County between here and San Diego. And you see that big network out in the desert. So when we see the desert today, we kind of think of it as a thankless, godless, arid wasteland. But for the native people, it, it was to be walked across, it was to be lived on, salt was to be mined from it, obsidian from obsidian butte. This whole network is going on. The opening slide, and I talked about El Golfo de Santa Clara. So the little town of El Golfo de Santa Clara is about right down here in Baja California. And the Gila River Indian Community Reservation, now known as the Taona Oil Dump, not yearly, but as needed, as determined by elders, they would go on a salt pilgrimage. And while it's true, they are picking up salt, it's more about putting young boys through an ordeal, it's more about learning songs, and it's more about contacting some people on the way. So they would take this route and it's split here through the Pinacates, you've been down this area, and end up down here on the beach. And these, of course, are young boys, young men who've never seen water before like this. They've never seen the Sea of Cortez. There's some articles written on this if you want to read about them. Um, you can follow up with this with a bibliography if you wish. And, and it's really interesting what you have to do and can't do. You are not supposed to leave the trail because the trail is there because the creator has allowed you to put this trail there, like the one I showed you earlier. But if you deviate from it, then you're in the world of snakes and gila monsters and ants and lizards, and you don't belong there. That's their world. They're letting you come across their world for a while, but you need to stay in this pretty prescribed area, this relatively narrow, narrow trail. And here's a trail most of us don't think about, canoes. Two of these balsas going out in the ocean. So this is Coronado Island off of Baja California. So if you've been out in that area, certainly if you've been to Ensenada or Rosarito Beach, you see the islands really well. On a good day, you see them from San Diego. You look south past the Coronado Bridge. So these are the Coronado Islands, not the town of Coronado here in San Diego. And while no one lived there permanently, there were resources out here that the people wanted. People from up here in San Diego County, even further north, people all the way down to Santo Tomas. So they would go out here in their canoes and they would basically catch abalone and uh, other shellfish and some fish. But it's mainly about the big shellfish that are out there. And uh, it was a very, it's a protected area today. So, INA, the Institución Nacional de Antropología y Historia, are they're out there currently doing uh, field work, recording these sites, looking at them, getting information from them. I think they got a date of about 1,500 years ago from one of the fire I'm not sure about that. 
So Coronado Islands, we thought about trails going out there. Wow, they were, they were just on the ocean, just on the ocean. As I mentioned to David earlier when we were talking, there's a Kumeyaay story that J.P. Harrington recorded back in 1925, that there were two uh, mythical spirits who were born on this island, two, two gentlemen, two men, and they were born here at some time in the far, far distant past. And at one point they decided they wanted to go to the mainland, they kept seeing the mainland. So they built canoes and they came to the mainland and they basically came down to roughly Rosarita Beach and they liked it and there was a lot more to eat and food and everything. And so they spread out, they stayed and spread out and became part of the, uh, of the land, the landscape. So some people believe that that is part of the Kumeyaay migration story, create, uh, yeah, creation story, that the creator put those, those folks on this island and then ultimately they got off and came to the mainland. Other people believe that San Nicolas Island, that they started on San Nicolas. And then once they got on the mainland here, there's a whole series of songs that the North Western Earl weed uh, out in Quichon territory and some other singers. They have this, this six hour song that starts in one part of uh, Southern California, Mexico, Baja California, goes up to Lake Elsinore, goes to San Jacinto, goes out to San Nicolas, and ultimately comes back. Some of the people end up in San Pasquale. Some of them end up in Manzanita, where they are today. So very elaborate stories, and all these songs have trails and trailing. So this is Jane Dumas. Uh, she passed away a few years ago, and what little I know about plants, and I think I know some, she taught me, basically. And I don't think there was a plant she didn't know, including introduced plants. She was a healer, curandero. Uh, her mother was, and her grandmother was. She was related to the Feng family uh, in the Hamul area. Uh, her tribal territory initially was Hamul, Jane Dumas's. And she uh, got into trouble occasionally, as her mother did, for practicing medicine without a license and by prescribing maybe plants. So she would always sort of do the disclaimer, like you see on TV commercials or whatever, vitamin. Let's say some vitamin. And then the bottom is that, by the way, this doesn't cure anything. It's not been tested, and you shouldn't use it for anything, basically. But, but here, let's sell it to you. Well, in her case, she was giving herbal plants out to people that did work and were efficacious. They did do good things. Um, but she would warn she shouldn't say it's going to cure or treat anything. Uh, quite the lady. So I use her as a good example. This is Arkansas Canyon, by the way, out in the desert on the east side of Santa Isabel. Um, Vulcan Mountain, when you drop down off of um, S2. That's where we're out harvesting sage one day. And there was a big ceremony coming up, and she was uh, the person who was supplying all the sage. So this is white sage, the Via Apiana. That was traded. Plants were traded. So it's not just the, you know, the exotic items like obsidian or gourd or salt that you might not have in your territory. Certain plants in certain areas, and Arkansas Canyon is one of them, were perceived to have more power than white sage growing somewhere else. Um, there's a plant called uh, Tacoma, like Tacoma, the town of Tacoma, big yellow flowers, and it has little seeds on it. And if you knock those seeds off, you burn a fire around it, and then the seeds pop out. Those seeds were very important to people in areas who didn't have that plant. And so little bags of seeds would be traded and taken back and forth. So how do you see that in the archaeological record? Well, you might in a pollen study, if you did a dig in your pollens, you might find pollens on a plant that really shouldn't really be there, but otherwise it's ethnographic. It's from reading J.P. Harrington's notes, it's from reading Spanish documents. So I want you to think about rocks moving, acorns moving, salt moving, plants moving, people moving, okay? songs, oral traditions. So lately, meaning the last five to 10 years, the Kumeyaay have been building canoes and out of tules. These are the tules in the background. This is actually the lake out at uh, Saquon. And these are two pretty intrepid young women out there in their tule boat going, going around the lake. Stan Rodriguez today, yeah, today was at Saquon making tule boats uh, out of tules and willow. And they'll be taking them down the ocean probably in two or three weeks and going out, out to sea in these days. Spaniards talked about this. Uh, when the Spanish first got here and they were still offshore, 
Korea, and I came up to them. I wanted to trade with them. I'm like, okay, here's a new trading partner. Wow, that's a really big canoe you got with the big sails. You must have stuff we'd like. And the Spaniard gave them some trade beads and gave them some cloth. This was by people in the village of Kosoi in San Diego wanted some cloth. And they filled up their canoe with it and sailed off. And the Spanish noted these people are, you know, they're entrepreneurs. They, they wanted to trade for this and this. In return, they gave them, by the way, sardines, fish, otter skins. When was the last time you saw an otter in San Diego? So they traded otter skins. And then a couple of nights later, the Kumi came back under the cover of darkness, jumped up on the boats with knives, and started cutting the sails apart. They wanted cloth. They wanted the cloth. So, of course, the Spanish said, oh, they're no good. They're just a bunch of thieves. Well, the Kumi probably thought they didn't get the good end of the deal. So they were coming back for more, coming back for more. So the Spanish sailors had to put guards on their boats at night to keep the Kumi from hacking at their sails. I'm sure you knew that. You got that in fourth grade mission studies, right? Yeah. You might have. Okay. Sometimes travel is not on the land. So this is not a horse. This is probably a cougar or a mountain lion. There's a whole series of songs and mythical stories about a, a shaman, a Kwisai, who could ride mountain lions. And they were of the mountain lion clan. And they, they would go into a vision, into a hallucinogenic state, and have a vision. And in that vision, then the mountain lion would come and allow them to ride them. And where were they riding them? into another plane of existence, into another world. But it's all part of one world. It's not like we might look at it when we have altered states. It's all one. It's just a corner of it that you normally can't go to. And in these travels, these shaman, the Kuyasai, would come back with um, visions, would come back with stories about how the weather's going to be, when the acorn's going to be right, uh, how's the manzanita going to be this year. And so, again, this is not a trail we're going to find on the ground, and it's not something that archaeologically one might be able to excavate, but this is a, a pictograph where we're showing this, where we're showing this. And then they had trails across the heavens. So there is a whole series of dream sequences that, that anyone could have. So having a dream, having a vision was not... Um, the purview of only select people. The Kumi'ai in particular and the Kwisan are very egalitarian in all manner of things. There were specialists for sure, but your dream was as important as a holy man's dream. And these dreams took you up to the sky sometimes. Sometimes you could dream through meditation, still be awake but meditating. You could quote daydream, or you could fast and not sleep for three or four days and then have an out-of-body experience and go to some of these places. This is Orion, except it's not. It's Emu. Remember the three dots? This is Emu. This is the grandfather protecting him. This is his friend or brother. It's kind of confusing protecting him. And these are the hunters. This is the hunter driving Emu towards this person who has the bow and arrow and wants to kill Emu. And so these guys are protecting him. Well, I've looked at Emu lots, and he never gets caught, right? He's still there. Every night, he's still there, so it must work out. So this winter in particular started, I think, about November. Go out in the night sky and look towards the, the southeast, and you'll see Emu out there. You'll see Emu. I've so warped my students. Um, the Kumi, I see a rabbit in the moon, not a man in the moon. They see a rabbit, like the Energizer bunny rabbit, actually, with those kinds of ears and kind of a body and a little cotton tail. I like Bugs Bunny, it's not like a big hair or rabbit. And now I have students send me emails. They go, when I look at the moon now, I can't see the man on the moon anymore. I see a rabbit. You've messed up my life. So I want you to see Emu. I want you to see Emu. This is the backbone of the universe. This is the backbone of the universe. We call it the Milky Way. It's Hachka, and it is where spirits go. And there's a specific trail that they take to go there on the land and then in the sky. And then they get to their rightful place in the sky. And so, again, night sky, which you get to see beautifully out in the desert, and probably up in Boise, Idaho, I would think, too. Um, I want you to kind of look at the sky a little differently that way. Uh, a colleague of mine, Mike Conley-Misquis, 
just wrote a book two or three years ago, a little monograph on Kumeyaay astronomy, the Kumeyaay cosmos. I would really encourage you to try to get that book if you're interested in astronomy and Native American beliefs and thoughts. We see Draco the lion, right? Because it's Draco the dragon. We have dragons, even though dragons don't exist, we have dragons in our stories. Okay? And so we see Draco. They don't see Draco. They see a completely other animal. So it depends on what animal you have in your culture. Okay? So net fishing in, in the lakes, meaning the old lake, Lake Korea, Lake Lacant, before it became the Salton Sea back in the day. Some of you have probably seen the fish traps out there in the Imperial Valley along the edges of the old lakes. But there were also uh, obviously ocean fishermen. So this was a major trade item. Native American people along the coast would go out, fish, catch this fish. Very smart, right? They didn't just throw it in a bag and try to make it to the desert in a day or two before it got too rotten. Cut off the head, smoke it. The Spanish talk about sticks, of fish after fish after fish, right along the ocean with little fires next to them. They're smoking the fish. The coast of people are smoking the fish. So now there's less of it. Yeah, so David's holding up Mike Conley's book, and I would highly recommend it. If you can, if you can see that there, and we could revisit that at the end of the lecture here. There's, there's just a lot of stuff written about the Kunyai now, whereas 20, 30 years ago, there's not. The beauty of Mike's book is you've got a Native American writing about Native American issues. That's how it should be. Thank you, David. Absolutely. Sure. Richard, we did have another question for you here as well. Uh, Angeline yeah. asked, there is a kiosk pictograph at Pedras Grandes, which says it features a horse and a rider. She always yes. had some questions regarding uh, its accuracy and if that was a correct interpretation. Uh, would you interpret it differently, like a cougar or something else, for example? No, that I'm pretty sure. I'm going to show you a mule and a Spaniard in a minute. But, but like every culture, when the Kumeyaay encountered something exotic or unusual to them, not because they were afraid of it, but they, they remarked upon it. So when the supernova blew up in 1052 or 54, we see that in the rock art, La Rumorosa. You see it throughout America, showing this giant supernova that suddenly was there one night. When the Spaniards first came in, uh, they did take to the caves and the rock shelters, and I think at this one base, one of them was one at La Piltas down in Baja California. And oftentimes they'll actually show not a sombrero like a stupid Mexican stereotype sombrero, but the little flat hat that the Spaniards tended to wear, they were not confused to the word wearing metal helmets, but we see them on horses. And I think it's legit. Yeah. I think it's legit. Absolutely. I may have, now the one I have is a mule. They also showed ships. There's a carving of a ship out in uh, Quito Canyon near the border that's probably legitimate. Uh, down in San Fernando de Venecata in Baja California, there's a petroglyph of a ship there, and it's pretty obvious of a ship. You can really see the sail in the body of the ship. So these things show up, absolutely, absolutely. There's a pictograph in Mission Trails Regional Park that they won't let you see, because people are being bad to it. And it probably represents the sacking of Mission San Diego in 1775. Yeah. If you go down to uh, Caborca uh, in the Sonoran Desert, the town of Caborca, a really beautiful town down the road from El Mesillo, there's a petroglyph outside of uh, Caborca that's life-size. There's hundreds of them. They go for two miles along this basalt escarpment. One of them, toward the end, closest to where the mission was, uh, is a man with a beard, and he's holding up a cross. And he's got a little beanie on, and he's got a knife stuck in him, and blood is pouring out of him in the petroglyph. I, don't, I know what that one means. People say, what does a petroglyph mean? What does this one mean? I know what that one means. They sacked the mission in 1690 and stabbed the priest to death. I know what's going on there. So yeah, I think the one at Peter's Grande is, is accurate. Thank you for that question. What have I got left here? About eight minutes. Hey, this is good. Eight or nine minutes. Um, so these goods, along with abalone shells, the abalone might not have traveled well, but we find abalone shells all the way into Phoenix and all the way into Tucson, even on the Kohokam sites, Anasazi sites, because it's got that mother of pearl iridescence to it. They also were oftentimes used as dishes, not for regular cooking. 
perhaps if you've been to a powwow or a get together, you'll see them uh, using abalone shells to put white sage in before they smud. So you see abalone shells coming from the coast, the rocks off of uh, Sunset Cliffs, for instance. Uh, we see giant clam shells, you know, the deck knife clam that we don't even have much anymore, five inches long, six inches long, made into necklaces carved on the Colorado River into Arizona. So the fish went as food, the bones and, and shells went as, as a, a peril, as things that uh, became part of ceremonies. These are olivella shells. Uh, so olivella takes its name from the fact it's shaped like an olive, a pit with an olive, and they're relatively small. And if you soak them in lye, or a natural lye compound, they get soft. And then you can take your stone knife and your obsidian blade and you can cut them. And that's what these are. So you can kind of see the scale here if you're on the uh, centimeter scale. This is one centimeter. And this is a half. But these are smaller than a half of a centimeter. They're smaller than, far smaller than a dime. Far smaller than, I'm trying to think of what they might be. Like a small button. Like a button on a man's dress shirt, perhaps. And they're ground and they're drilled. Prior to the Spanish getting here, they were drilled with stone knives, very sharp little stone needles. Once the Spaniards got here, the Kumeyaay started stealing their needles, their steel needles, and drilling them with needles, and the holes get smaller, and they get cleaner, if you will. These happen to be from Mission San Diego, an excavation I did there in 1989. And these were all of shell beads. Again, these are common in San Diego County, and they're made here in San Diego County. Some are shaped um, rectangular, probably were brought into San Diego County from the Shumash. It's also an olivella shell, but people have done isotope studies on them, and it's from the ocean closer to Santa Barbara than the ocean down here. The chemical composition is different up there, and the Shumash made them as money and traded them down here. And then in return, the Kumeyaay and the Kitsan traded other things back up to the, back up to the Shumash. What are these used for? They're not used so much for money, they're used for adornment, sometimes sewn into a piece of clothing, other times worn as a necklace. Uh, these people did in fact have pierced ears, pierced noses, and so sometimes uh, they were probably used for that. Archaeologists like these because you can date them, you can do radiocarbon dates on them. Richard, we have another question here. Yeah. Uh, this sure. was concerning uh, olivella, she ol olivella shells as they relate to currency. Uh, was they were they ever used in a sense uh, relating to trade as a commodity, actually as a way of marketing or um, denoting value? I, I think it was as a commodity. It wasn't. It wasn't the way it is up in Northern California, where you have the Intellium or in other wampum belts back east. It didn't have an intrinsic value uh, in and of itself. But you could, you could trade it as a bag of olivella shells for salt, or a bag of olivella shells for a gourd that only grows out near Hakumba. So in that sense, it, um, I don't want to compare it to money in a capitalistic, this is more of a barter society, verging on mercantilism, if you will. Uh, but yeah, it, and the value would change, you know, depending on how many of these beads had been introduced last month. If you come with a new bag this month and you want to trade them for a bag of salt, they might say, no, nah, we got all, we got enough of those beads. We'll give you half a bag of salt. Good example of that is in 1778, the commandant of the Presidio of San Diego could not feed his men. So if you've been to Presidio Hill there in Presidio Park, he could not feed his men. He didn't have enough food. So he sent his sergeant up to the coast, specifically to a village in Rose Canyon, San Clemente Rose Canyon, with trade beads. He gave them two um, saddlebags of trade beads and said, go up and buy fish from the Indians. And so they did. Ortega, Sergeant Ortega went up. He came back with, with three mules loaded with beautiful sea bass and kelp fish and really good food. So they ate pretty well for you know, a week or so, whatever. And then Moncadas gave him some more trade beads, beautiful white and blue and yellow trade beads, and sent him up the coast to buy some more. He came back with half as many. And the commandant asked him, why don't you have as much? Didn't, didn't they go fishing? Didn't they have fish? No, they had lots of fish. The price went up. 
the price went up, right? Capitalism at work. There you go. This is probably a Spaniard on a mule, right? Probably a Spaniard on a mule. Um, I think this is somewhere not too far from Acatillo. I'd have to look up exactly this specific site. Uh, I owe a lot of my slides on rock art to Ken Hedges, and I don't memorize them like I should. So to, to the lady's questions or the person's question, absolutely. They, the Kumeyaay people in Sam Ria up at Anza, when Anza came through, near the town of Anza now, on the Kerry Ranch, there's cave paintings there that clearly are men on horseback. Clearly the guy has his little flat cap on. And we can pretty well date that one sometime after 1776, or whenever Anza came through. I should know that. Yeah. I think there's about four slides left, and I'll certainly entertain any other questions. I've got about a minute left for a 55 minute lecture. So here's one of the things that did happen. When the Spaniards came through, this is a guy named Tisher, beautiful artist down in Mexico. And so this is about San Diego Indians and the Baja California tribes. But this is the type of hat that they, these fellows wore, not the big, big sombrero like you see on some Taco Bell sign or something. Uh, oftentimes a cloak if they were not going into warfare, and on and on. So when you see rock art, pictograph the petroglyphs, but simply pictograph, when you see this kind of hat, and, and of course it looks something like this, it's probably the real deal. It's probably the real deal. I use this because this slide, because the Spaniards interrupted some of the trade patterns by bringing natives into the mission and by sending um, soldiers out into the back country, let's say El Cajon, piece of San Diego, a village called El Corral, they kept their herds there. The, the Presidio kept their herds out in El Cajon Valley because it was good grassland. So now if you had a trail, which probably became Highway 8 later, if you had a native trail running through that valley, you might want to avoid those soldiers and their horses because there were rapes at the village of El Corral. There were actually some rapes and then killings by three soldiers. And so it somewhat disrupts the trail system. But whereas before, people have said it broke up the trade system completely, that's just crazy. They're simply going to go around them. They're going to go around where the Spaniards are. They're not going to come through Mission Valley quite the same way they used to. Uh, if they know that El Camino Real going up the coast is likely to have soldiers on it during certain times, they're going to avoid that. So there is going to be this clash of cultures, absolutely. Um, trade goods are going to come in that the Spaniards have and give those to the Indians, Native American folks, and they might now choose a metal pan over a pot. If you've studied in the Great Lakes history, for the woman there in Wisconsin, once the French brought in copper pots, the Huron and the Ottawa, those people living up there, they love those copper pots. And once the French were kicked out of America in the French and Indian War, they were sad because the British came up and tried to give them British pots. And the Ottawa said, suck. I want French copper pot. I'm making cash and lead tonight. I don't want your silly British pot, right? So what happens when you get new cultures coming in and new technologies is it can upset the balance. So if you were known as a really beautiful pottery maker, or a person who made great cooking pots, now you're competing with a copper pot from France. Right? If you are a great stone worker making beautiful arrow points, now metal is coming in and people want metal arrow points. So this acculturation process and no doubt the economics broke down. Broke down. So in 1987, if you were around, well, excuse me, 1989, uh, in San Diego County, I was down at Mission San Diego digging from February to July in a, in a place that the uh, Monsignor and other people associated with the mission said there was nothing out there. So why do you have to do a dig? But we did this dig and we found the first mission in Mission Valley. Not the first one on Presidio Hill, but the first one where the mission is today. Where, and it didn't burn down. We found the lens of charcoal running across it. We found the second mission that was rebuilt. The one you go to, in, to today is the fourth mission on that piece of property. But here's one of the things we found. This is a porcelain arrow point. It's a porcelain arrow point. So when the priest broke, the, the cook broke a plate, 
then the kumi I would retrieve that plate from the trash pit, from you know the basura, and then flake it and make arrow points out of it. So we start finding after the Spanish did here glass arrow points, uh, ceramic arrow points, whiteware arrow points. So if you know blue flow wear, which is really common in this time period, you know the white wear is semi porcelain. It's got the blue rims around it. That's what this is. This is actually uh, it's uh, emulating Chinese wear. So if you have this whole thing, it would have a Chinese scene on it with trees and a little boat going down a canal and a little trellis. I've always wanted to find a burial of a Spaniard that was shot with a few porcelain arrow points. I thought, how ironic that would be. I had to come across that too. So this is a side notch. If you're in the business of the desert side notch, porcelain point. This is one of five that we found there. So, gosh, here we are. So I told David I might change this to say, what, what, what did we just learn? Because I'm supposed to be more inclusive. But I kind of know this stuff a little bit. So maybe it's what did you just learn? So hopefully I want to stress to you that trade was more common in warfare. Did I mention warfare? Not a lot. There was not a great deal. And when there was, it was more small battles, usually for revenge, often, no surprise, about women. The Mojave were famous for coming into San Diego County and trying to steal Kumeyaay women. I'm not going to get into that because I get into trouble, um, but Kumeyaay people, like Ralph Chrisman, say, well, you know why? And I say, no. And he goes, have you ever seen Mojave women? So I'm just going to leave it at That's Ralph Crispin saying that, not me. Um, there actually were some genetic reasons the Mojave were, were having trouble um, procreating female women, female genders. So they came in and stole, tried to steal Kumeyaay women. Did not always go well for them, by the way. More often, it was about someone came into your territory without permission. So then you took your makanas, your clubs. You went out and found the aggressors, and, and you pushed them out. You didn't have this kind of warfare that you see on the East Coast or with the Apaches, in some cases, with the Navajo, uh, because many of these people are related. Trade was extensive and intensive. Went on for thousands of years. Big villages have the Cherokee all over the place. Sometimes plants were brought in. So a site that I dug in Ramona, uh, the Oak Country Estates, which is now the um, Ramona grasslands, 600 acres, part of it. We found mesquite pollen. And not, it didn't blow in from the desert, trust me. And it was way deep, and there was a lot of it. So I think they were growing mesquite in Ramona, where it really doesn't belong. Sometimes you'll find elderberry growing somewhere that truly it does not belong because they use it for medicinal purposes. So they're bringing in plants, they're trading. You can see the material goods here. I hate to read PowerPoints. So I want to stress that, yeah, lots of stuff came in, but also ideas and beliefs. So some of you might know about the Datura culture and niche and niche uh, religion. It came probably from the Gabrielania into San Diego County and affected the Kumeyaay. Lots of dynamic and fluid exchange. Exotic goods were costly, sure. And then the Spaniards closed some of the routes, but certainly not all of them. So I always try to have a sunset at the end of my talks uh, because some of you know me, I don't lecture from notes. And, and certainly I tend to want to go on sometimes. So if I, if I get to a sunset, it means I'm done. Um, the talk. So this is El Golfo de Santa Clara. This is where my family and I had camped for, this was our 50th year last year. Um, we we're probably not going back because there are people older than me and they just can't be making this trip much anymore. Uh, so that son is basically studying on um, San Luis, across the border at San Luis. And this is uh, the Sea of Cortez, the Gulf of California, off to the left. A very beautiful spot. A very beautiful spot. So, David, what do I have to do now in terms of I'll stop sharing this and open up the screen here a little bit? Excellent. Well, okay. Richard, thank you so much. I appreciate this fantastic talk. We do have a few <laughs> questions here. The first ones actually uh, are already coming in. So All before right. we do anything else, I'm going to turn the floor over to our audience, and I'm sure that they have a few questions. First two actually come to us from Angeline. So Angeline, would you like me to read what you had said in chat? Or now that we are finished with the primary talk, you can actually speak yourself. If you have a mic. Can you hit your unmute button? Um, all right, so. Oh, Sorry, yeah. I, okay, I unmuted. Um, 
I can't remember which one I asked. I have so many, and I'm so interested. And that was a great talk. Um, what was the first one I asked? Oh, I don't want to rename. Oh, the DNA. Okay, yeah, actually, I do have a question. Okay, about the... Um, uh, I was wondering... Yeah. Me, I also have chin tattoos. Is that correct? And if so... Yeah. Okay, so recently I saw a um, talk between a Maori tattoo artist and a Chumash woman, and they were talking about how they have recently discovered DNA and cultural links between the Maori and the Chumash, and the Maori are mm -hmm. helping the um, Chumash kind of uh, reestablish their chin tattoo tradition because there, there's a link there. And I'm wondering if there's something similar uh, or if the chin tattoo thing is, is the same, was it passed on as a culture tradition from the Chumash because of proximity or do the Kumeyaay have their own? And can you talk about that a little bit, please? And what does it mean? Thank you. <laughs> well, the what, what does it mean is, is, is arguably answerable, meaning many people would say and anthropologists recorded this back in the 1880s and early 1900s, Constance Du Bois and some others, that they were clan affiliations. It was basically your, your way of telling somebody, and typically it was female, of telling somebody what clan you were from. So you see a lot of three lines. Sometimes they're lines, sometimes they're dots. So what you're telling somebody when you get together, let's say you're a single woman, and you go to a big feast and big get together with lots of other clans and lots of other families, um, uh, a male from that other clan or family would know not to be interested in you in a sexual mating way because you're of the same clan, because he knows what those dots or those lines mean. In other cases, if for older women or or people in general who might do this, it's clan identification. It's 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 something they're very very proud of. So it's not simply ornamentation. It's um, it's a mark. In some cases, it's believed for the Kumeyaay, it was also a village. So you might have some chin tattooing that represents your clan, and you might have something under your eyes or somewhere else that is more about your village. So it's a, it's a marking device to, to, for you to proudly tell the world, it is believed, who you're associated with. Um, in terms of, of um, Diffusion versus independent invention, that's what we call it in archaeology anthropology. My guess is the Kumeyaay independently invented it within themselves without help from the Shumash simply because it looks like probably the, the, um, the Quitsan and the people out on the Colorado River had always been doing it. It was recorded really early, I mean like pre-1700s out in those areas because the Spaniards got there first and they talked about it. So I think, you know, I think it came from the East like a lot of other things rather than from the North. That's my, that's my opinion. Good question, good question. What else? We did have, we did have one other from Angeline as well. Uh, Angeline, this okay. was your Chinese wear question. Okay, sorry, I was getting pizza delivery from my son. Um, okay, yes. So, um, my question was, you mentioned something about emulating Chinese, um, Chinese styles when you were talking about the points or something. Um, that was about the time I was getting delivery. But, um, so, <laughs> that um, indicates exposure to Chinese, obviously, and I, I know the talk about the, the bow and arrow maybe coming from Chinese, China, but as far as other contact by boat, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so let me go back and clarify. Sometimes I speak too fast and I know exactly what I mean to say and it doesn't always come out that way. What I was saying about that particular piece of porcelain is that was actually, um, it probably was Chinese porcelain that the Spaniards brought over because Spaniards had this, I'm speaking of the trade route, they would come all the way around, you know, South America, and they would go to the Philippines to the Manila, to Manila, and they were called the Manila Galleons. And in Manila, the people living in the Philippines had contact with China, and they were the middlemen. So the Chinese traded to Manila, the Spanish picked up those wares, brought them to California, 
and they appear on the mission sites. So it wasn't direct contact, it was like secondary contact. And I was telling David earlier, one of the Spanish accounts for this book I'm trying to finish, uh, one of the Spanish accounts of the mission is the Padre priest is complaining about his cooks, his Indian cooks, his Kumiai cooks. And he's saying they're very careless, they keep breaking my plates and my bowls. And he thinks they're clumsy. I want to suggest to you they're not clumsy, they're quarrying, they're breaking the plates on purpose, then they're throwing them out the back door, and someone's picking them up and making arrow points out of them. It's just, it's something, you know, again, when you read the Spanish documents, you have to take the filter off of what he's seeing, just like when they said, oh, these, these people are really lazy. Well, they're not lazy. They're not used to working more than five hours a day. That's all they had to work. They're not lazy. They know exactly what they're doing. Or they didn't plant the corn correctly. They planted it too deep, and now the crop's ruined. They knew exactly what they were doing. It was passive resistance. Yeah, you're not going to get a crop out of here. Yeah. So, but in terms of, of, of Chinese, there certainly are archaeologists, especially in South America, who have dug coastal sites, and they're pretty convinced are thousands of years old that are both Japanese and Chinese. But if you left that part of the world and you got caught in the Alaskan current or the California current, you're going to end up in Scammon's Lagoon or in Peru. And so there are some sites down there that are probably bona fide Japanese Chinese sites. And who knows what affected them? Yeah. Good questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. Our next question is from Michael. Michael, uh, I think you had a question there. Yeah. Uh, thank you for, for a great talk. I had two questions, one that's sort of more general, another one that's very specific. So I'll start with a more general question. Um, at the beginning, you had this very tantalizing statement about globalization. Uh, so I was wondering if uh, we could go back to that for a second, and if you could uh, describe for us what you see as a Kumiai globalization, what that would look like and what the boundaries of that system might be. Sure. So I guess like all of us, I sort of get to my pet peeves or my biases or things pop up, and I noticed when I started teaching anthropology versus archeology span uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, we, the textbooks were really huge on globalization. It was like somebody woke up at Harvard or some, I don't know. And you know, this is a new thing and it came out of economics, right? This is anthropology. And so then everybody wants to glom on to another discipline stuff. You know, so we use the words fission and fusion and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, so I would go to lectures and people would talk about trade or I would, I would be with some of my colleagues and they were looking at trade in a reasonably narrow focus. And I thought, well, let's take this cool word that people like to use right now and stick it, stick it in this, this, this thing. And so it's like, it's like people did not want to use the word medicine for, for kumya healers. Well, that's not medicine, right? That's not medicine. So here's what I meant by it, and here's their sphere of influence as far as I can tell. So there were about 80-some villages, kumya villages in San Diego County. Uh, it's, it certainly could be... Uh, argued one way or the other, but let's say 80, that's a nice round number. And probably 20 of those have been excavated, some better than others. And we're not gonna go into that. And the trade network that we see in the archeology, span not to mention what the Spaniards talked about, is we do occasionally find turquoise from Phoenix area. And, and there's different types of turquoise and people who do chemical studies on it. So if I wanna go east, I would say the global world of the Kumyai went at least as far as there. You know, if you want to go down towards the Colorado River uh, and into the Gulf of Sea of Cortez, and perhaps you've done one of these sites, we found some sites for the um, golf course in Mission Valley, started the old Stardust Golf Course, and they had Olivella shell bees, but they were Olivella dama, which is a different species that we get on the coast. So, so they were going at least that far or somewhere from there was coming up here, right? Um, we do find steatite from the Channel Islands, not the local uh, Stonewall Peak soapstone. Uh, we find uh, clay eff or effigies, steatite effigies that are clearly shoemaker, if you know Chester King and this typology, and I do. So it goes at least that far. And then of course, Coso Hot Springs Obsidian, much better than Salt and Sea Obsidian, the coast is way up the coast, right, by Mammoth. So I got to go that far up to there. 
right? Yeah. And then when you go further south, uh, Lee Panich and Pocayo uh, from Ina have now been sourcing obsidian. And it's not just salt and sea. And it's not just one place in Baja, California. It's, it's you know, Trace Vejones and Free Virgins. It's uh, San Felipe. So I would draw a big circle like that. That would be my globalization. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Great. <laughs> all of Aladama goes all the way to Spira Mounds on the Mississippi. Um, yes. But I guess, uh, yeah. I, I guess I would, <laughs> yeah, I guess I would add to that, that, you know, ideas, like you were saying at the beginning of your talk, obviously flow far further than, than goods, right? So we might be able to draw yeah. the circle even bigger. Um, I think so. Yeah, I, I, had a, I had a really specific question. Um, you mentioned that the Spinthrift site, that there were uh, DNA connections to, to the Chumash. I, I, was, I, I was wondering um, who did that work? Um, it was an old collection. It, it was a, it was a spin, yeah, spin, it was an old collection from Malcolm Rogers at the Museum of Man. And David or somebody can provide you with my email address. So you, if you don't have it, you can Google me on all of the It's R. Kerry Cohen, yeah. SDSU, EDU. And I can find a citation. I want to say it was a, there were two different studies. One was a female, and I want to say her last name was Kent. I've just been reading these. Um, and she did it kind of unbeknownst to some of the local Native people some mm. years ago mm. when the Museum of Man was moving their collections around. And that's what she came back with. I think it was A and B. I'm not great on DNA, but I think it was the A and B apologue. Hello? Yeah. So if you contact me, I'll send you the citation for that. It's online. And then the ones from San Nofri that Pauli Zell dug back in the 70s, we didn't do DNA. Um, but the artifacts and the method of burial and the way they faced the West and all of that was very clearly Channel Islands. Yeah. So now the dispute we need to say is did the Channel Islands people come from the Kumiai or did the Kumiai come from Ch Channel Islands or are these isolated Channel Islanders, Nicolinos, who came down here, right? And I stay out of that. Well, you know, we, we, we know that people were, were going from San Diego up to the Channel Islands. So, I mean, why not? Absolutely. Yeah. If you ever Thanks. read Saltwater Boy, which is a fictional account of, of a true village, Saltwater Boy by Lee Millicent, that village was probably the one in Rose Canyon, Honop. And when that little boy goes out in the ocean, that's where he's ending up. He's not going south to Coronado. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? Because you pretty well know everything I know now. We did have one more from Angelina as well here concerning corn. I was out at Piedras Grandes one time and I was I was looking in one of the caves there. They have a ton of boulder sh rock shelter kind of things. And um, I, I thought probably I was looking at an old campsite where people had built a lot of fires. But then within that, it was really strange because within a very shallow, um, I wasn't digging. It was right, right on the surface, a tiny little corn cob. <laughs> and I was confused because I, it, I didn't think that there was agriculture west of the Colorado in that way, but I mean, I'm, I'm sure there could have been trade, but sorry, that's my dog. I'm throwing pizza for her. Okay. So, um, so I, I, I I, I kind of wanted to know more about that. How, how could there be that tiny old fashioned Pueblo style corn that far into Piedras Grandes, into the An Anza Borrego South area, right? Right. It's pro it was probably, if one did DNA on it, it's probably maize, you know, not the American European corn, probably maize, which is a Zia. And, and Gifford, for instance, back in 1918 and other early anthropologists and Spaniards saw corn being grown almost up to the Algodones. And so that group of people, the Kumiai living out in the desert, Gifford, this is one of my little bents, Gifford was hard of hearing. Uh, I knew people who knew him when they were much younger and they maintained Gifford was very hard of hearing. And he was probably hearing Kamiyai, Kumiyai, and he made it into Kamiya. So I personally believe the Kamiya are Eastern Kumiyai with agriculture. There have been pots found up in the Santa Rosa Mountains that had um, maize in it, just like you're describing, and also um, a couple of peas or beans that were domesticated. 
They weren't wild, wild peas. They were domesticated in pots, um, probably pre-contact. So that's led some people to believe, and I'm not one of them, but honestly, that the Kumya had an agriculture here in Stanley County, Lawrence Shippick thought they did, for instance, and some other people have suggested they did. I don't think they needed it between the ocean and the acorns and the chia and the buckwheat and everything else. But what you found might have been one of those Western extensions of, of agriculture. And like you say, trade, you know, or maybe some, you know, I always think about things in terms of families, maybe some family intermarried with or had trade with some people from that area east of the Algodones, and they got some from them and brought it back and cooked it up, and you found part of it. Yeah. Well, and it, I think that um, some of the culture came from the east, from the, the southwest proper, because it looks like right about the time of contact, they found the, no, they found the kumiai um, practicing some kind, I mean, some kind of morphed kachina sort of situation. Ching, 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 or chinik, chik, or something. Yeah, I forget what it's called. But I, Yes. <laughs> and so I wonder if maybe there were certain pockets of people who were practicing the, the Eastern prop, Southwest proper kind of ways and it included agriculture. Maybe that, that could have happened. They were probably doing a combination because some people think to niche niche came from the Gabrileno, but I agree. I think when you look at some of the, for instance, a couple sites that I've excavated and put in the mission, we found clay effigies. And coffee bean clay effigies, those are clearly Ohokam style that, that came in. We found a, a carved owl, an owl effigy made out of a Kaliota shell. I mean, it's, no, it was um, cardium, which isn't from around here. So all kinds of trade for sure, for sure. Yep. I have, I yeah. have a question just to follow up on that. Um, is there a Kumiai word for, for maize? Not that I know of. Only there is for corn, but it's it's actually a borrowed word from Spanish. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the my office mate or my my room my department mate Margaret Field at San Diego State, who's a linguist, right? And she studied Navajo. And that was her dissertation of her study. But she's been working a lot with the Kumeyaay South of the border. In fact, we have a grant right now, and we're doing uh, come up with 450 Kumeyaay place names. I've got them on a map, it's driving me crazy. Um, so she had been looking for those types of things because certain people early on, let's say pre Harrington, almost Kroger, even maybe pre Kroger, thought they were hearing some words that were borrowed words from other natives about crops and about corn and about those things. It's, it's such a it's it's a gray area in both time and in space. So uh, so if I hold this up, can you guys see this? So this is a diary of the Commandant of the Presidio in 1778. Rivera um, Moncada, he comes to a bad end on the Colorado River in 1781, by the way. Uh, they kill him, the Indian people do. But in here, he's on an entrada, leaving the Presidio. He's searching, he's searching for bad Indians who sacked the mission. And he gets up to Ramona, and he gets up to the village of Pamu, which is out by the airport. And as he's getting close to it, he looks down, and he sees they're growing wheat. So this is, this is seven years after the mission was established. The mission couldn't even grow wheat. They were having trouble growing wheat, and these guys are growing wheat over there. So that raises the question, you know, when Shippick would say, well, no, they always had that. Well, they couldn't have always had it because it was an introduced plant. But we forget that by the time the Spaniards get here in 1769, they had in Tucson and Phoenix and San Javier de Bach for 120 years. And when Costanzo goes up the coast in 1769, just about Mission San Luis Rey, some Indians come out and they're not surprised. They go, oh yeah, we've heard about people like you. We've heard about the mules. We've heard, we've heard about your swords. We've heard about this. And they're stunned. Costanzo's stunned. And he goes, how could that possibly be? Because they've got contact with people on the river who had contact with people in Phoenix and had people in Santa Fe. So they're not surprised. They go, oh yeah, move on. Let's keep going. Go to yeah. But but he Moncada was stunned about the wheat and even said something like, This there's no crop like this at the mission. Where do they get this stuff? It's cool. Yeah. That's what I was doing all day, besides practicing for this tonight a little bit, was 
reading 1770 Spanish. So if I don't sound literate sometimes, it's because my it's crazy. You know Bill Eckhart, don't you? I kept calling Bill Eckhart saying, what does this mean? What does this really mean? So, all right. Angela, we speak to me. Okay. Take your I, I, yeah, can you hear me? Okay, so I have a question. Yep. Um, I think that there was some kind of change in the recent, like since the, um, since the mission system period, I, based on the pictographs I see, I think there was a different wave of people that came through. Um, Carissa Gorge, for example, something interesting is happening out there at the summer solstice and the, the images are very new. And I wonder if there, if you know anything about, I mean, there was a lot of movement probably around the 1300s and there was a lot of movement around the time the Spanish came through 1500s, probably a lot of movement around the time of um, the, the missions. So do you know anything about different groups coming through the, the Kumeyaay region, possibly leaving their marks? Not specifically, but you're right. I mean, between Europeans coming between the, the big drought of 1050 to 12, 1250 to 1290, which probably didn't affect the Kumeyaay here, but it affected the people, obviously, the Anasazi and Morillon and Coho Compact, they blew up and dried up and blew away. I mean, they didn't, they just became different people. So there are, there's pretty good thought that, for instance, the Hohokam, who became, later became the Toono Oldam, moved into the, moved into the Colorado River area. And, and brought some agriculture with them and, and helped the Quetzal do certain things. That would probably show up in rock art. You also had um, some fighting, some wars, if you will, going on between the Mojave and the Pima, the people it used to be called the Pima, and people with the Chimahuevi. Chimahuevi were almost completely moved out of their territory to go somewhere else. So it was like a two toothpaste. If you squeeze it, it's going to come out here. And so I agree with you. I'm not a rock art specialist, and I, I try to avoid rock art unless it really, really interests me uh, because it's too complex for my brain. And people like Ken Hedges do a great job. But he has suggested that he sees a culture of traits, if you will, in different styles, uh, even different pigments being used, different colors sometimes than is traditional. And he's tried to uh, deal with that. I, I think Ken believes, Ken Hedges, that some of the material, even La Lumerosa, uh, some of those very brilliant, almost psychedelic paintings on the ceilings that you have to lie down and look up at or done by other people than would have been there traditionally. So I think you're right. I think you're right. There's probably more questions than answers. Yay, I'm right. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah, I thought when I got out of graduate school, I knew everything. I'm sure David thought he knew a fair amount too. And then once you get out of school, then you actually start learning. <laughs> What school does is it builds you a toolbox, you know, and then you have to go do something with it. And sometimes my toolbox works better than others. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? We just wanted to say that the uh, cobbler was great. <laughs> yeah. I see the wine, and I see the wine in your glass. Yeah. <laughs> that made it even better. <laughs> But Did you have it with ice cream? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, a, it, it, it's a good recipe. It's yeah. a really good recipe. So that was my grandmother, Alt, who lived back in Indiana, a German lady. And um, because I had a father who ran off, just ran off, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, my grandmother raised me, largely. And she thought it was so funny that as a six-year-old, I wanted to learn how to roll out dough and make pie dough and do things. And then she would go off and do laundry. And when she came back, I had a pie. I'd bake the pie for her. So oh, wow. I love, I love wow, the cook. Good. Very good. Good. I'm jealous. I got to go make some now. <laughs> and we had someone else actually join us as well. It looks like Paula made it as well. And she said it paired very well with chicken. Oh. Wow. Excellent. Did Bill Eckhart join? I'm looking to see if my buddy Bill joined. We did have a bill in there, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so that cobbler recipe 
if you make homemade vanilla bean ice cream and put that on it, it's, uh, it's, it's good. Vanilla ice cream. Oh, I have a really good homemade peach ice cream. I couldn't find it though. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you all had a good time and drank some wine. That's what I'm going to do next. Yum, 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 yum. Oh, yeah. 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 good. I can smell the almond extract. Yeah. I think I might have put too much in it, but it was delicious. Thank you. Yeah, almond extract is like ginger. You can definitely overdo it. You think, oh, a little bit. I need more. And you really don't. You really don't. It was great. Thank you very much, Richard. You're welcome. Excellent one. Do we have any final questions for the night? No, but thank you. It was very interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's, and it's, thank uh, you so much for attending. I have three or four passions, and, and ethnography and the local people is in the top two. The top two. We're just glad we got to like learn something without like just watching a movie on TV. So thank you, David, for setting this up too, because it's just nice to get some education. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, David did, so much, David did a great job. Yeah. I have to say I really enjoyed it, that's all. Well, good. Um, down the road, and I'm not sure when it's going to be, it's typically March, the Society for California Archaeology uh, their annual meeting and they move it up and down the state. It goes from north to south and back. Um, and it's a combination of professors and professionals and a lot of students. So obviously it's virtual this year. So you don't have to travel. You don't have to pay crazy fees. Once they've set it up, uh, I'll make sure that uh, David and I can send the link out for it because it's all going to be online and you can jump back and forth to sessions. And we're organizing one right now with the younger generation in Baja California who's doing archaeology of Ina so that they can give maybe their first paper virtually. There won't be people in the audience scowling at them or whatever. And it's going to be really exciting if you want to know more about what's happening south of the border. Because, you know, as Kumi I say, uh, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. And when you get down into northern Baja California, you still have a lot of native speakers and native pot makers and basket makers. Uh, some of whom, unfortunately, are dying off, but they're doing some really good archaeology and anthropology down there, too. So we'll keep you posted on that. Okay. What? Well, I hear oh, a Cabernet Sauvignon one last question. my name. Yeah. Yeah, I got the final question. Okay, so um, I, I, here's a question. I don't know the answer. I'm asking if you have an opinion. Um, so around the time of the... Um, the Aztec culture um, blossoming. Did uh, I do understand that? Like the 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 Mishtec came in; they were part of that. But then other people were pushed out. Do you do you see any of the backflow up in the Kumeyaay area from that, or are they too far to the Baja area? I I mean I, I don't know if you know I, this, but I I don't. I I would I would guess that if they did, it, they went more up towards. Arizona and New Mexico, simply because that was probably their homeland to begin with, was somewhere up there. And this area would not have been very attractive to them. That's just, that's just the top of my head. Yes, thank you. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Well, everyone, I would like to give a big thanks to our speaker for tonight, Richard Carrico. And Richard, thank you so much for joining and helping to be our evening with an expert for this evening. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for joining us and participating in this first event of our fall season. We have two more events coming up for the fall. Next month on the 14th, we have our next evening with an expert, Gary Malloy. He'll be speaking on reflections of the past and the present, looking at the evidence of the First Peoples and the other indigenous groups of the region as they can be found still in the landscape today. The link for this is available today in our chat section right here now for you. Uh, that is the Facebook link. But if you prefer to access directly via Zoom, the link is also available here now. Uh, Sending that to you right now. There we are. And in addition, in December, we have our fall concert series. This is our Songs of the Desert 
featuring violinist and composer Beth Chafee Hahn. And this will be taking place on December 5th, again at 6 o'clock to 7.30. And I'll be providing the link for you right there as well. Both these events are made possible free of charge to everyone who would like to participate. So please do get the message out. If you enjoyed this tonight, tell everyone how amazing it was and hopefully we'll see it, uh, another enthused crowd for that time then. In addition though, these events are sponsored and uh, made possible through the museum's uh, regular programming, which is supported through people like you. So if you do enjoy this and did have a good time, we'd ask that you please consider uh, supporting us through a donation. Uh, we are accepting donations right now through PayPal. A $10 donation will automatically enter you into a, no, $10 donation will automatically enter you into an opportunity for uh, to be, uh, for a raffle, which we'll be hosting on December 5th, and the prizes include an HDTV, an off-road adventure, and some gold star wines selected by our own Richard Carrico. If you enjoyed tonight's selection of wine, just remember that that's the same quality you'll be getting with his selections <laughs> for this gold star, uh, gold medal wine. In addition, on December 5th, we have our silent auction, which includes a four-night get vacation getaway, beachside getaway to Monterey, California. And you can actually see the and see the location and the waves crashing as you can take a look at through Martin Fitzsirka's uh, feed right now. So that is the view you'd be enjoying if you happen to be the uh, winner of that. Bidding starts at $600, and you can do so through our Facebook page or by contacting the museum directly. The link for that I am happy to provide to you right now as well. And, and posting into the chats for everyone. So there's a number of links there for you. Please do check it out and hopefully we'll see you in just a, uh, under a month's time on November 14th for our next evening the next. Thank you to everyone and hope you enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, David. And